Good morning. I'm Paul Edmondson, president of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. I'm very pleased to welcome everyone as we announce the 80 recipients of the National Trust Telling the Full History Preservation Fund, which has been made possible through a one-time grant from the National Endowment from, or for the Humanities as part of the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. I wanna start by acknowledging that the National Trust Headquarters Office in Washington, D.C., where I am today, sits on the ancestral lands of the Nakochtank or Anacostan peoples. Wherever you are today, I hope you'll join the National Trust in affirming our deep respect for indigenous sovereignty, history, cultural traditions, and experiences. The National Trust relationship with the National Endowment for the Humanities has been a long and productive one. We very much appreciate our colleagues at NEH and the work that they do to enliven the nation through the humanities. At the heart of historic preservation lies the very essence of the humanity, humanity disciplines, focusing on the places where people have lived, creating culture, language, literature, and the arts, and enriching our society with the common values of humankind. And today we find ourselves in one of the most defining moments of cultural history, a moment in which we have the opportunity to better acknowledge the complex history of our past and to expand our collective understanding of each other as a path to a brighter and more just future. Today, we're making important progress towards that future. We're here to celebrate these 80 organizations around the country, organizations that are doing the work of interpreting, preserving, in activating places of meaning and importance in their respective states, regions, and communities. I wanna thank Representative David Price of North Carolina and Congresswoman Shelley Pingree of Maine for their participation today and their unwavering support of the National Trust and the NEH. I applaud their leadership and that of their colleagues in Congress in creating the American Rescue Plan as a way to ensure that places like the ones we celebrate today and the stories they hold will continue to endure and to serve as catalysts for the task of making a better wor world through preservation. And with that, I'd like to in introduce my colleague, Catherine Malone France, Chief Preservation Officer of the National Trust to provide additional information on this important program. Catherine. Thank you, Paul, and good morning, everyone. This is an incredibly exciting day for the powerful combination of the humanities and historic preservation. For all of us at the National Trust, serving as one of the stewards of the National Endowment for the Humanities American Rescue Plan grants for humanities organizations is a tremendous honor. We approach this task with a deep commitment to the idea that the humanities are vibrantly alive in historic places and the work to preserve and interpret places that tell our full history is an effort that brings us together and binds us together as a country. As we designed this program, we also brought a real ambition to elevate the incredible work of the grantees, organizations and institutions across this country, and to support them in truly meaningful ways. And we understood that this opportunity in and of itself is historic, and we're honored to play a part in supporting the humanities at this incredibly important moment in our country's history, when we need more than ever, the things we all have in common, the things that make us all human. While the National Trust has had a long relationship with the National Endowment for the Humanities, and we've been a federal grant maker, a grant maker of federal funds before, this initiative represents the single largest grant from the NEH in our history. And today, we will be awarding the largest number of grants at any one time ever in the more than 70 year history of the National Trust. We thank the National Endowment for the Humanities for their vision and foresight in creating this program. And we thank our congressional partners for having the deep understanding that preservation and the humanities infrastructure are intrinsic parts of robust 
and vibrant communities. Thank you also to Representative David Price and Representative Shelley Pingree, who we'll hear from shortly. The almost 400 applications that we received for the Telling the Full History Preservation Fund represented a true cross-section of America, not just in organizations, but in places, stories, people, and activities. As we promoted this program, we activated our networks and channels to find as many different types of organizations doing this sort of work. I want to especially thank all of my colleagues at the National Trust for this great outreach and all those around the country who helped us spread the word about this program. We also made sure that our jurors reflected the applicant pool, both in diversity and in subject matter expertise. I want to thank each of the jurors, some of whom I believe are on the call today, for their time, energy, and deep dedication to this work. We are so proud and so pleased that the list of awards announced today includes large museums, city and state agencies, nonprofits of various sizes, and coalitions and partnerships of all kinds. Each of these projects, though, that are being funded embodies the power of telling our full history, expanding our collective understanding of ourselves through historic places. And as we work with these extraordinary grantees over the next year, we will have the opportunity to demonstrate together how the humanities and historic preservation help us build a more just and equitable future. We are especially pleased and honored to have the chair of the National Endowment for the Humanities with us today. Dr. Shelley C. Lowe is a citizen of the Navajo Nation, and she was named to the post of chair of the National Endowment for the Humanities in January by President Biden. She has been connected to the NEH for several years through the National Humanities Council, an appointment she received from former President Obama. Throughout her esteemed career, Chair Lowe has been a leader within respected academic institutions, including both Harvard and Yale. I'm so very pleased now to invite Chair Lowe to share her remarks. Yeah, good morning. My name is Shelley Lowe and I am Chair of the National Endowment for the Humanities. I am joining this event this morning from Cambridge, Massachusetts on the traditional homelands of the Massachusetts tribe. It is a pleasure to be here this morning to congratulate the recipients of the National Trust for Historic Preservations telling the full history preservation fund. The National Trust has been a partner to NEH for many years. In 2001, the organization was recognized for its service to the humanities with a National Humanities Medal conferred by President Bush. And today we extend our thanks to the National Trust for their careful and fruitful stewardship of American Rescue Plan Act funding. As many of you know, the National Endowment for the Humanities was pleased to receive supplemental funding from Congress through the American Rescue Plan Act to help support and sustain humanities institutions and practitioners impacted by the pandemic. This stimulus funding has made possible the creation of the Telling the Full History Preservation Fund, which focuses on amplifying important untold stories of American life. All 80 of today's recipients are working to highlight and tell the stories of underrepresented cultures, communities, groups, and regions that are part of our American historical narrative, including the lives of African Americans, Indigenous peoples, Latinx, Asian Americans, immigrant groups, LGBTQI, and those with different abilities. They represent more than 39 states and communities ranging from large metropolitan centers like Los Angeles to small towns like Fairway, Kansas. Each of these places holds stories that have not been fully understood or appreciated. These funds will directly help share knowledge about our humanity and inform the public about parts of our histories that have often been absent and overlooked. Some of these histories are difficult and distressing, such as those of the Shawnee Indian School, the Japanese internment camps, and the lynching sites of Memphis. By telling and recording these stories, 
we remind ourselves of the painful parts of our history so that we can heal and commit to do better in the future. There are also projects that celebrate our culture and humanity, such as Casita Maria in New York, where they are celebrating the Latin jazz and oral histories of the people of the South Bronx, or the city of Providence, which will create a cultural heritage installation in collaboration with the churches, businesses, and people of the Broad Street area, or the work being done in El Paso, Texas, to protect and honor the Nuhlihi Dui site for its significance as an ancestral Tiwa village important to the Isleta del Sur Pueblo culture. And the Kohala Center of Kapa'au Hawaii will use traditional Hawaiian processes to capture the stories of the sacred spaces of Niuli. I could go on and on and speak to the many other projects. I hope that you will learn about them all. I am delighted that many of these organizations are new applicants and partners to the National Trust and NEH. Some are small volunteer-led organizations, others are municipal governments or museums and preservation organizations. This means that we are both expanding our work and importantly, expanding where funds are awarded through our systems and processes. These grants reach far across the nation and support organizations of various sizes and impacts. Collectively, they create a powerful American story, one of beauty filled with survivance, cultural and community healing, joy and celebration. In other words, the stories of humanity. Congratulations to each of the awardees. I look forward to hearing from the grant recipients in their own words. Ahiahat. So much, Chair Lowe. As we honor these impressive projects made possible through the American Rescue Plan Act, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome Congressman David Price to this briefing. Congressman Price has represented North Carolina's fourth congressional district beginning in 1987 and has established himself as the foremost champion of the humanities on Capitol Hill. In 2004, he worked across the aisle to form the Congressional Humanities Caucus and has led many efforts since to support our nation's cultural legacy. Since arriving in Congress, Representative Price has worked to promote the humanities and the preservation of our nation's history. And today we are able to celebrate a remarkable accomplishment that is helping tell the full history of our nation which will enrich the lives of many generations to come. We are incredibly grateful for Congressman Price's leadership and support of this work. And we are pleased to share his remarks to honor these many remarkable awardees. Good morning, I'm David Price, Congressman from North Carolina's fourth district and the longtime co-chair of the Bipartisan Congressional Humanities Caucus. Great to be with you today, if only virtually. I am pleased, especially pleased, to join to celebrate the grantee of the National Trust for Historic Preservation Telling the Full Story Award, Telling the Full Story Preservation Fund. Such funding dedicated to the full recounting, the full um, uh, encounter with our nation's history that comes at a critical juncture in national conversations on, uh, on this, this history at a time when some are urging the, the whitewashing of history. Some are urging that uh, history should be told only in ways that uh, make us feel good and proud. We know that that isn't uh, true history. True history represents an encounter with our past, with its negative as well as positive aspects. And um, hopefully that lays the groundwork for a, a better future. I like to think of this as a kind of honest patriotism you know, we love our country, but uh, we also um, love it enough to mend its flaws. And an honest history is absolutely essential to that. Uh, and so uh, this, this award couldn't be more, more timely, the Telling the Full History Award. And the uh, awardee couldn't be more uh, appropriate because uh, it's the Pauli Murray Center located in my own district in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, the uh, center uh, works to preserve the legacy of Dr. Pauli Murray, and it represents uh, the uh, commendable practice. They do it every day of connecting history 
with contemporary human rights issues. Uh, Dr. Polly Murray, raised in Durham, was a trailblazing human rights activist and legal scholar and author, wielding the power of the written word as a tool to push for the rights of African Americans and for members of the LGBTQ community. The Center's work to bring the stories of Dr. Murray to life both inspire us and um, inform us as we continue the quest for equality and justice and launch the next generation of community leaders. So as co-chair of the Congressional Humanities Caucus, I recognize this work and recognize it as part of the broader work, of course, of our uh, cultural institutions. The uh, news on the humanities front is, uh, is uh, a little better now than it would have been a few weeks ago because uh, the uh, fiscal 20, 22 funding bill has now been officially passed and signed into law, and it includes $180 million, $180 million for the National Endowment for the, for the Humanities. So uh, that, uh, that represents some improvement, and it represents the hard work of a lot of you on this uh, call to uh, advocate for that. And of course, uh, right away, we're thinking about fiscal 2023 and your visits and your advocacy and look, looking forward to once again supporting the humanities through the NEH and other uh, related accounts. So glad to join you and uh, bring greetings this morning to note, a, note this award and this awardee and to encourage you to uh, continue with uh, your work in advocating for the humanities because the kind, of, uh, the kind of education, the kind of sensitivity, the kind of awareness that the humanities convey is absolutely essential at this point in history if we're to have a better future. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Congressman Price. We are honored to have another member of Congress participate and celebrate these outstanding grantees today. Congresswoman Shelley Pingree has served the constituents of Maine's first district since 2009, and she has been a stalwart champion of the humanities on Capitol Hill. She chairs the House Interior, Environment, and Related Agencies Appropriations Subcommittee, which has jurisdiction over the annual NEH funding, as well as funding for the Historic Preservation Fund. Her leadership on this subcommittee has yielded significant increases for historic preservation and the National Endowment for the Humanities. She has worked diligently with colleagues on both sides of the aisle to support the important work of the NEH. Congresswoman Pingree is a member of the Congressional Humanities Caucus, and she is co-chair of the Congressional Arts Caucus. We are very pleased now to welcome remarks from Representative Pingree. Hi, I'm Congresswoman Shelley Pingree. First, I want to congratulate Greater Portland Landmarks, one of 80 organizations nationwide, to receive a grant to preserve, interpret, and activate historic places to tell the story of underrepresented groups in our nation. These grants, awarded across 39 states, would not be possible without the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Historic American Rescue Plan, both of which I've been proud to support in Congress. Through my role as Chair of the House Appropriations Interior, Environment, and Related Agencies Subcommittee, which oversees funding for the National Endowments of the Arts and Humanities, I've pushed for increased funding for the NEH because I know how important it is to bring our history with us into the present. Historic sites and lands are what makes states like Maine truly great, not only for enhancing culture and encouraging learning, but for driving economic development and boosting tourism. Maine's rich history, lush land, and vibrant culture are woven into the very fabric of our communities. But it takes work and money to ensure these parts of our states remain intact. Without nonprofits like Greater Portland Landmarks and the organizations like the National Trust for Historic Preservation that support them, the historic places that made America what it is today would be lost to time leaving our full America story untold. As a member of the Congressional Historic Preservation Caucus, I'm proud to advocate for Maine's many historical sites that are in need of preservation and revitalization, 
Most recently, I secured $1.7 million in federal funding in the FY22 omnibus bill to fully complete restoration on the Obsidian Meeting House in Portland, the third oldest African American church in the United States. With this vital funding, the Obsidian will become a living piece of history, giving our community and all those who visit the opportunity to step up into the past and learn about the important role the Obsidian had in seminal events in our shared history, such as the Underground Railroad and advocating for the abolition of slavery. There are countless historic sites across Maine and across the country like this that need our support. I'm grateful that while I push for federal funding in Congress, nonprofits and organizations are working with unwavering dedication to save our history. Thank you for all you do and take care. Thank you so much, Representative Pingree. Now I am pleased to welcome four of our 80 recipients to share with you their stories and a little about their projects. We wish we could have all the, rep the recipients share uh, their stories, but that would be the longest <laughs> Zoom press conference ever. But we will be sharing the stories of these grantees across our channels um, as their projects happen. So today we had to choose just four though, and I'm pleased to say that they each have amazing stories and projects to share. I'm going to introduce all four of them now and then they'll speak in this order. First, I am pleased to welcome Monique Brinkman Hill, who is the Executive Director of the storied Southside Community Arts Center in Chicago, Illinois. This is a special place with an incredible history where art and artists converge to create community empowerment and culture. And then we'll hear from Clement Hanami, art director at the Japanese American National Museum in Los Angeles, California. Clement will share how the museum is using technology to help contemporary audiences understand the tragic history of 1942. And then Chief Ben Barnes of the Shawnee Tribe will share about the tribe's important and complicated work to preserve and interpret the Indian school in Fairway, Kansas. And lastly, Victor Reta with the city of Socorro, Texas will share a fascinating project called Rio Vista Farm, a former farm and site for processing Bracero populations. Good morning. My name is Monique Brinkman Hill and I'm the executive director with the Southside Community Arts Center. We're proudly located in Chicago, Illinois in the heart of the historic Bronzeville community. The Southside Community Arts Center was founded back in 1940 under a time of deep segregation with the WPA or the Works Progress Administration, along with a hundred other art centers across the country. We're proudly celebrating over 81 years, and we have the distinct pleasure of being the only remaining WPA Art Center that remains in its original location and with the same mission to conserve, preserve, and promote the legacy and future of African American art and artists while educating the community on the value of art and culture. The Art Center became the home to many. African American artists, including some of our founders, Dr. Margaret Taylor Burroughs, uh, Charles White, Bernard Goss, Elsa Couture, Archibald Motley, William Carter, Joseph Kersey, uh, Gordon Parks maintained a dark room at the basement of the center. And moving forward, some of our artists of today to name just a few, Cecil McDonald, Fahim Majid, Juarez Hawkins, Jesse Howard, Carrie James Marshall. There have been so many artists that have come through our doors that our main gallery, the Burroughs Gallery, has wood paneling up that has holes that represent a space and a place where another art has hung before. So when our artists come and they do exhibitions, they're not sure of whose art was there before them, but they know that there have been many proud artists that have come through our doors. 
We're super excited. We received the Chicago landmark status in 1994. We were named a national treasure in 2017, and we were listed in the National Register of Historic Places in 2018. With all of our amazing history, our beloved building is in need of some important improvements, including, but not limited to, an addition of an elevator to help us uh, have access heating and cooling upgrades, plumbing and electrical, as well as other maintenance concerns. And we couldn't be more thrilled to have received this important grant from the National Trust for Historic Preservation to help us preserve the house that Art built. We plan to use our funds to hire an architectural firm to help us restore and reimagine the building while at the same time remaining true to our historic landmark status. This grant will be critical because it represents the early phase of a major project renovation that we're going to do in collaboration with the state of Illinois. For those who have not been a part or been able to visit the Southside Community Arts Center in the past, we strongly encourage you to come on by, stop in. We're open Tuesday through Saturday, and we really want to see you in the place. We want you to witness some of the great things that we have to offer. We've got a new exhibition coming up in uh, next week, actually, April 15th, which is the Emergence Intersection at the Center, which is the celebration of some of the amazing artists within the Black LGBT community that were part of the Center from its founding in 1940 through the 1980s. This exhibition will run through July. I also encourage you, if you're not close by, to follow us on social media. We've got a lot of programs. Some of them are virtual, and we want you to be a part of them. We want you to know more about this hidden jewel in the Brownsville community. But most importantly, we really do want to thank the National Trust for this important, for historic preservation, for this important grant that will allow us to launch this project that helps us restore and preserve the house that Art built. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Clement Hanami and I am the Vice President of Exhibitions at the Japanese American National Museum. As a, as a national museum, I am currently at the Noguchi Museum in Astoria, New York, where we are traveling our work to a national audience. I'd like to just take a moment uh, to acknowledge that the Japanese American National Museum is located in Los Angeles and its presence on the, on, the, on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Tongva peoples, who experienced brutal discrimination by European settlers and colonizers. We pay our respects to the Tongva people as, a, as the traditional caretakers of this land, where the Japanese American National Museum now resides. This land, where the museum works, continues to reveal the challenges of a country that would draw on laborers from distant shores to help build a nation founded on the ideas that all men are created equal. Our project, Be Here 1942, uses the brick facade of the former Nishi Honganji Buddhist temple as a site of conscience for people to remember. It was originally built as a place where the first generation Japanese American community uh, built in 1925 as a place of worship to bring people together to celebrate their faith through religion, festivals, funerals, marriages, and more. A safe place where people could thrive. But in early May of 1942, this site would become one of 108 exclusion zones where Japanese Americans lined up with only what they could carry. And from there were systematically removed from the Western halves of Washington and Oregon, all of California and parts of Arizona and sent to American concentration camps against their will. More than 120,000 would ultimately be impacted. Whole communities were driven from their homes and businesses. The economic losses were staggering. The emotional toll of being uprooted, accused of being the enemy, and not knowing what future they faced would last a lifetime. 
Today, this site is home to our museum, the history told inside within our museum walls. Be Here 1942 will change that by creating an augmented reality work that allows people to view the historic building, the historic facade, the, the historic site, as it might have been for many in May of 1942. Looking through their smartphones, people will be able to see Japanese Americans lined up to board buses that would take them to Santa Anita Racetrack, a temporary detention center, while more permanent ones were being built in the most desolate areas of the country. People can walk along the block and through their, their devices, they'll see all the different people that were impacted. Elders, children, men, women, families, often dressed in their best clothes because that's what the government told them to do, heading to a future that was unknown and unchartered, a future in a country they thought was home. This act perpetrated by the country and its own citizen is just one example, a very large example of anti-Asian hate that was per perpetrated on one community. Of the 120,000 that would be affected, two thirds of them were American born citizens. Regardless, they were not seen by how much they, they loved their country, but rather by the color of the skin. They were not judged by the valor that Japanese Americans had on the battlefields of Europe during World War II, but rather the shape of their eyes. People say there is a surge in anti-Asian um, hate, but we know it has never gone away. Systematic hate against Asians has existed from the very beginning of immigration to this country. Asians have and continue to be the target of hate, regardless of how many generations they have existed in this country. I myself am fourth generation. This project is to raise awareness of a grave injustice that happened um, against Americans, not by foreigners, but by its very own people. It is our goal that by sharing this story of injustice and the struggles of being an immigrant that might look different and it is in many, that this experience is in many ways um, universal to all people in this country, to those who have been denied power and privilege and suffer from discrimination. And that in learning these many diverse histories is to understand that this country was built by the contributions of many people from many walks of life and from many backgrounds. It is vital and critical now more than ever that as a country, we learn to talk with our neighbors and more importantly, listen, listen to their stories and understand that we are all Americans seeking to live in peace and respect for all people. The museum is grateful to the National Trust for Historic Places, the NEH, our political leaders, and to all who have supported this important program. Thank you. Good morning, and I greet you in the language of the Shawnee people. I'm Chief Ben Barnes of the Shawnee tribe an indigenous nation of several thousand citizens living across North America and abroad. Our ancestral homelands lie within the greater Ohio Valley region. However, it was during the earliest decades of the founding of this nation that colonial pressures forced Shawnee communities to move through most of the Eastern United States. Shawnees also experienced forced removals westward over the past 200 plus years, which ultimately fractured us into the three sovereign tribes comprising all Shawnee people living today. For my people, our westward migration ended when we arrived in Kansas in 1828 and then chose the area of present day Shawnee, Kansas as our headquarters. After our arrival to Kansas, the United States Indian agent in Kansas contracted the Methodist Church to establish the Shawnee Indian Manual Labor School. The Manual Labor School was situated on 2,000 acres in the heart of the Shawnee Tribes Reservation. Our Shawnee people not only funded its construction and operation, but our citizens helped to build it. The Shawnee Indian Manual Labor School ran from 1839 into well into the Civil War. And the three yet standing buildings of the Manual Labor School 
are among the oldest residential buildings in the entire state of Kansas. This place would become the center of American power on our reservation. Today, visitors to this national landmark can still see and tour the dormitories of the manual labor school and learn that Shawnee children were required to sleep in an attic after laboring in the school's fields. In truth, we all have much that we still need to understand about the Shawnee Indian Manual Labor School's operational history. Who were the Shawnee children that resided there? What were their names? And what were their stories? How many of these children never returned to their families? And when they died, where were they buried? Now 160 years after the closing of the school, the Shawnee tribe, we are honored to be a recipient of the $25,000 grant from the National Trust telling the full story, full story history preservation fund. This grant will help us prepare an official historic structure report for the three two-story brick buildings that still stand at the Shawnee Indian Manual Labor School, which is perhaps the oldest surviving federally mandated Indian boarding school in the United States. This historic structure report or HSR is acknowledged in the museum and preservation professions as the baseline for preserving and managing historic sites. It is important for an HSR to be robust, including details on the site's historic significance, the structural chronology of the building, or the changes that occurred there over time, its existing conditions, as well as recommendations for repairs and maintenance. This grant and the forthcoming HSR will support the Shawnee tribe's overall goal of completing a full period restoration of this Shawnee sacred site and in creating an updated interpretive program with the accurate history to restore this national landmark to its period of significance. The Shawnee boarding school has touched the lives of virtually all our Shawnee citizens as our ancestors either attended it or impacted by it. The Shawnee tribe we're not unique in this experience with the United States policies and practices on the quote unquote civilizing native children through boarding schools and through other means. It is estimated that more than 40,000 children may yet may be buried in unmarked graves at labor and boarding school sites across the United States. For far too long, the truth about American Indian boarding schools has been absent from national conversations. Others may have forgotten, but America's tribal nations have not. We are encouraged to have the support of the National Trust for Historic Preservation, the National Endowments for the Humanities, and the Kansas State Historical Society as we begin to uncover boarding schools for full history. Hola y saludos de la ciudad de Socorro. Hello everyone and greetings from the city of Socorro. My name is Victor Reta, Director and Historic Preservation Officer for the city of Socorro, Texas. America's most unshared story of resiliency. Over the past 80 years, the city's worst kept secret has paid tribute to over 4.6 million remarkable and underrepresented individuals. Farmers, fathers, brothers, sons, and entire families and will soon be recognized for their lifelong and binational achievements. Our national celebration of history and heritage exuberance continues today. From the Rio Vista Community Center for Anthropology and Culture in Socorro, Texas, we honor Braceros. Through our work, we will honor the Braceros, the individuals who have paved the way for modern America today through binational significance and sacrifice, cultivating agricultural crops during the World War II era. With each of the stories we will illustrate, the strong Bracero, the ones who undertook the treacherous, extraneous, and grueling journey from Mexico into America, the ones who did the backbreaking work under the seasons of the hot sun, the ones who cultivated the crops with a short hoe, the ones who worked agricultural fields so that others can have food, the ones who endured deplorable treatment in the field and abroad in order to continue receiving a paycheck to send back home the trailblazing Bracero, the ones who stayed after the government work ended, the ones who dared to defy what the norm was, the ones who continued to blaze a trail forward by becoming American citizens, establishing their families and adding to the tapestry of the American culture. And lastly, the provider Bracero, 
the ones who made the difficult decision to leave their families behind to attempt at getting a government contract. The stories of the women and families who were left to survive without the men in their family, to endure without the traditional patriarch and how they navigated their family and their absence. An executive order entitled Mexican Farm Labor Program created the Bracero Program in 1942. The series of diplomatic accords between Mexico and the United States permitted millions of Mexican men to work legally in the United States on short-term labor contracts. These agreements address a national agricultural labor shortage during World War II, and implicitly, they redress previous depression era deportations and reportations that unjustly targeted Mexican Americans who were US citizens. During World War II, the US sought labor from millions of braceros who would return to their country of origin after their work permit expired. The County of El Paso, Texas, the US port of entry from Ciudad Juarez served as a recruitment center for the program. The United States and Mexico agreed on a set of protocols that would protect braceros from discrimination and poor wages. Nonetheless, discrimination continued and Braceros experienced subcharges for room and board, deducted pain, and exposure to deadly chemicals. The Rio Vista site is the last remaining processing site still standing. The Bracero program concluded on December 31st, 1964, and had brought more than 4 million Braceros to work in the United States agriculture on railroads as mechanization began more widespread. Ultimately, as a result, Braceros evolved into migrant farm workers and eventually led to unionization, unionization farm worker advocacy, and campaigns for better civil rights. How fitting it is today that we continue to celebrate this story as this year marks the 80th anniversary of the Bracero program. In the words of Dolores Huerta, si se puede. Through the generous grant made possible by the National Trust for Historic Preservation and the National Endowment for Humanities, the city of Socorro will have the ability to hire staff and create public programming which will help share, educate, and illuminate the story of the Braceros and their vital role in developing modern America. By partnering with the University of Texas at El Paso, the Institute for Oral Histories, the Texas Historical Commission, and the testimonies of Braceros who are living with us or the testimony of their families who still share the story today, we will help share this vital story with our community. The Rio Vista Farm Connections Project will focus on research, development, and implementation of first-time public interpretive programs, highlighting the history of the Rio Vista Farm and the Bracero Program and its impacts on legacy and connections to the present. The project will identify impactful multimedia resources and culturally sensitive interpretive tools to amplify the underrepresented Bracero story and its true impact on the fabric of American society. In the coming year, the project will yield a book club, public tours, interpretive tours, and public engagement events. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at the city underscore of underscore Socorro. Now, it does not get lost on me that I am standing on the exact mark where over 1 million braceros were processed, or that I worked in the very office where they broke bread with one another. It is a true honor and humbling experience to know that we are the custodians tasked with the responsibility of sharing their story with the world around us. Braceros gave us, gave me the stereotypical millennial Hispanic male hopes and dreams to be a better, a reason to fight and a voice to speak up. However, how can we thank you? The true answer is we're not entirely sure. But when you all followed your dreams, worked hard and gave us the allowance to follow our dreams. The Barcelos crawled so that migrant farm workers could walk, so that Latinos today could run, and so that our future generations can flourish. The most surreal blessing is the opportunity for us to share your story. For our heritage, you are our icons, our living legends, and our ancestors. So now the world will know how much you affected the Hispanic families who may have started in Bracero farms, but grew to expand our nation and thusly the world. To all the Braceros who are no longer with us and those who we are fortunate to still know, we will honor you. It is time to make a place. The city of Socorro stands in solidarity with each of the grantees and applicants in the mission to continue sharing of our stories, our history, and educating the public on our culture. However, we cannot do it alone. We, as my fellow grantees and applicants can attest to, 
rely on federal and philanthropic funds to continue help empower and share our stories to help shape and educate the world. Mackenzie Scott, if you ever hear this or see this, each of us would be thrilled to work with you. In closing, Dolores Huerta tells us, giving kids clothes and food is one thing, but it's much more important to teach them that other people besides themselves are important. And the best thing they can do with their lives is to use them in service of other people. The city of Socorro welcomes and invites you all to learn and visit the Bracero site in Socorro, Texas. Gracias. Thank you so much to, to each of our four grantees this morning for, for sharing their stories and their places with us. Thank you to Monique Brinkman-Hill, Executive Director of the Southside Community Arts Center. Thank you to Clement Hanami from the Japanese American National Museum. Thank you to Chief Ben Barnes of the Shawnee Tribe. And thank you to Victor Reta with the city of Socorro, Texas. And now I believe we're gonna take some questions from the press. Uh, and I think my wonderful colleague Priya Chaya is going to be uh, reading those to us. Priya, take it away. Yeah, so I'd just like to remind everyone to feel free to submit them using the Q&A panel at the bottom of the screen if you haven't already. Uh, but the first question that came in um, was actually about getting more information to the public about how they could join with partner sites to donate additional private dollars to these phenomenal projects and how can they do that? That is a fantastic question, Priya. And um, we are very hopeful that, that again, this exposure is, is going to bring additional support to these incredible places and the, the folks working to preserve and interpret them. You can see the entire list of grantees on our website. And I believe that Priya is gonna be dropping that link into the chat. It'll also be on the screen uh, in just a moment, but it is www.savingplaces.org forward slash neh-telling-full-histories. So please go to our website. You can see the full list there and we'll be adding links to each of the grantees so that you can go from there to their websites. And we do encourage you to support them all. Thanks for that great question. Yeah, so we also got another question from the press, which is pretty easy. Um, is there a standard press release? I believe there is a standard press release, and I think you can also find that on our website. Great, I don't see any other questions, and I think you just let everyone know how to reach us. Um, I'm also gonna drop into the chat uh, contact information for our Senior Director of Public Affairs, Brenda Jones. Um, we also have a slide that will show all that information that Catherine just read. If Rhonda wants to throw that up. Um, and if anybody who's a member of the press has a question, um, you should feel free to reach out to Brenda and she'll be happy to get you the press release and any other information you might need. Um, but if anybody has, we'll wait a second to see if anything else comes in. Okay, thanks Priya. Well, please do reach out to us um, and please do check out this incredible list of 80 grantees. Priya, any other questions? Okay. No, I'm not doing anything. Okay, well, I just want to thank again everyone for being here. It's been so great to see in the chat um, people telling us where they're from and their organizations. We're so, so glad to, to have had all of you with us today. <clears throat> We especially want to thank our colleagues at the National Endowment for the Humanities, especially Chair Lowe for being here with us today. Also, thank you to Representative Price and Representative Pingree for joining us as well. I also want to thank my colleagues here at the National Trust for all of the work they have done to, to conceive of and then begin to implement this incredible program, the Telling the Full History Preservation Fund with support from the National Endowment for the Humanities and the American Recovery Plan. But most of all, thank you and congratulations to the extraordinary group of 80 grantees. At the National Trust, we are so honored to work with you in telling our full history through places, your work makes our country stronger. Thank you. <laughs>